Ernest Shackleton's 1914 expedition to cross Antarctica on foot has been one of the most famous disasters in exploration history. His ship, the Endurance, was crushed in the ice and sank before even reaching the continent, leaving the crew stranded in one of the most dangerous environments in the world. Shackleton and his crew had to fight for survival while the Endurance sat useless on the ocean floor. Recently, the wreck of the Endurance was discovered by search teams, broken and battered, but decently preserved, despite its failure, or maybe because of it. Endurance has become legendary. Another ship from the same period had a different fate. While Endurance was lost beneath the waves, the Norwegian ship Fram sat in a museum in Oslo on display for visitors. Just a few years before Shackleton's voyage, Fram had carried Ruold Amundsen to Antarctica, where he became the first person to reach the South Pole. Some years before that, Fridolf Nansen sailed on Fram in his effort to become the first human to reach the North Pole. While he didn't quite make it, Nansen and Fram both survived. The story of Fram is one of repeated success and survival, yet its story is less well known. Why did these ships have such different fates and legacies? Let's dive into the history of these amazing ships to find out. Their stories are ones of clever engineering and the dynamic personalities of expedition leaders who sailed them in pursuit of glory. You are watching. We are born explorers. Keep exploring. Our story begins with Fridolf Nansen, a Norwegian scientist with an interest in zoology and oceanography. Nansen was also a keen adventurer and spent time skiing across Greenland, but his ultimate goal was to be the first person to reach the North Pole. He framed his quest as a battle with the ice and the Arctic. He considered himself to be acting in the tradition of the Vikings, and he certainly looked the part. To Nansen, venturing into the ice was a form of combat, and he needed the right weapon, a ship that could take him safely into the frozen Arctic seas. To craft the right weapon, he needed to know his enemy. Nansen was a scientist and a student of the Arctic. He studied descriptions of Arctic sea ice in travel narratives and carefully tracked the progress of other expeditions to the poles. By the late stages of European imperialism, explorers had mapped most of the world's surface outside of the Arctic and Antarctic. In the 19th century, European and American explorers ventured deeper into the Arctic hoping to find new routes to Asia, the fabled Northwest Passage, or even a Northeast Passage. But these passages proved impossible to use because of the ice. European explorers shifted their goals, and a new competition emerged to get farther north and farther south than anyone had before. Explorers embarked on these epic quests to achieve personal fame and create prestige for their nations. This was the heroic age of polar expedition, in which men like Nassen raced to be the first to the Arctic Pole. Nassen studied previous explorations carefully, and one stood out, the voyage of the American ship Jeanette. Captain George DeLong of the Jeannette attempted to reach the North Pole through the Bering Strait in 1879, but Arctic ice trapped the ship, eventually crushing and sinking the vessel. Before their ship sank, the crew tracked their position over time. Despite being trapped in ice, the position of the ship changed over time. The sea ice around their ship was moving. The fact that sea ice moved was not a new realization, but Nansen believed that it had the key to reaching the North Pole, a strange occurrence before the Jeanette expedition gave him the idea. Sometime after the expedition, Inuits in Greenland discovered artifacts from the Jeanette frozen in the ice near their shores. These items must have drifted in ice from the Bering Strait, bringing them close if not right through the North Pole. If these items had floated across the poles on the ice, Ice. Could Nassen do so as well? In previous Arctic expeditions, getting trapped in ice was a hazard to be avoided entirely or a major inconvenience to be endured until the ice melted. For Nassen, it would be the primary strategy in his battle against the ice. What he needed next was a ship that was up to the task. 
While many of his peers were doubtful about the expedition, Nassen received a large sum of money from the Norwegian government. A great deal of this cash went into the construction of the Fram, a ship specially designed for polar expedition. This was not a usual practice. Most ships used in these expeditions were repurposed. It didn't always make sense to construct an entire new ship for a single expedition, but Nassen managed to recruit ship designer Colin Archer for the unique project. Fram was designed from the beginning to not only endure the ice, but to use the ice to its advantage. For this, several aspects of the design were of utmost importance. The shape of the hull had to be rounded so that as ice pushed in on the ship, the ice would lift it up rather than crush it. Nansen and Archer used materials that could withstand the enormous pressure during this process. Oak, iron, pine, and green heart. Sails and a steam engine provided propulsion. The ship was also designed to be small. This reduced the weight as it was pushed up on the ice, and it made it easier to navigate between ice floes. Nassen, unlike many of his peers, paid close attention to the Inuit methods of navigating dangerously icy waters. He knew that they did this using small and nimble kayaks. Fram owes much of its success to the experience and expertise of the Inuit, as imitated by Nassen and Archer. Another of the Inuit tools for Arctic travel were sledges pulled by dogs. Nassen brought teams of dogs with him on the Fram, as did many other polar explorers. If the ice drift did not bring them directly over their goal, the dogs could be used to travel over the ice to the North Pole. They were also the mission's safety contingency if anything went wrong with the Fram. Nassen and his crew set sail on Fram from Oslo in 1893. They sailed along the coast eastward towards the final position of the Jeannette north of Siberia. Then the ice set in. Fram performed her task beautifully, floating up on the ice, and the crew began their long drift towards the North Pole. Their time on the ice was not the battle that Nyssen had dreamed of at the conception of the mission. On the contrary, the long Arctic winters were a dreary affair, entirely without sunlight at latitudes so far north. Crews that overwintered in polar regions had to endure living on the ships while they waited for the ice to break up. Polar exploration ships like the Fram were often cramped on the inside, since reinforcements to the hull made the interior of the ship smaller. They could spend some time outside the ships, but around them was nothing but ice. They would have to live like this for months. Nassen described his frustration in his book. Oh, at times, this inactivity crushes one's very soul. One's life seems as dark as the winter night outside. There is sunlight upon no part of it except the past and the far, far distant future. I feel as if I must break through this deadness, this inertia, and find some outlet for my energies. Can't something happen? Could not a hurricane come and tear up this ice and set it rolling in high waves like the open sea? Welcome danger if it only brings us the chance of fighting for our lives. Only let us move onward. Nassen, page 211 to 212. It wasn't that Nassen didn't expect this. He knew that if his theories worked out, this long waiting period was an essential part of the journey. But Nassen was a man of action, and the long wait aboard the cramped ship grated against his nature. Later in the expedition, Nassen would get his wish. Nassen and his crew waited aboard Fram for a year and a half until Nassen realized that the course of their drift was not going to take them directly through the pole. In March 1895, he made the decision to leave the ship and to make the attempt using skis and dog sled, leaving the Fram and its companions behind. Nassen and a companion set out into the Arctic ice. We found large expanses of flat ice and covered the ground quickly, farther and farther away from our comrades, into the unknown, where we too alone and the dogs were to wander for months. The Fram's rigging had disappeared long behind the margin of the ice. Nassen, page 372. 
they didn't reach the pole. Nasen made it just past 86 degrees north before encountering ice so forbidding that they could go no further north. Winter was coming, and they sought shelter on Franz Josef Land, a group of islands to the south. They spent the winter season in survival mode. They constructed a small hut and hunted bear and walrus to sustain themselves. After over a year in the Arctic wilderness, an incredible fortunate turn of events led to their survival and return home. They were picked up in 1896 by British explorer Frederick Jackson, who happened to be traveling through the region. He picked up Nansen, saving him from a perilous situation. Nansen and Fram were reunited in Norway that August at the end of a three-year expedition. Nansen had not reached the North Pole, but he demonstrated his theories about Arctic ice drift, and his crew collected useful scientific data during his mission. Because Franz survived, it was able to participate in one of the greatest success stories of polar exploration. The impressive performance of the Fram made it rule Amundsen's choice in his attempt to reach the South Pole in 1911. Amundsen raced against British explorer Robert Falcon Scott to reach the Pole, arriving there not long before Scott. Scott and his companions met a tragic fate on their way back, but Amundsen and his crew safely returned to the Fram. The South Pole had been conquered, and that goal was now out of the reach of other intrepid explorers. But a crew member from a previous Scott expedition still had ambitions in Antarctica. Ernest Shackleton wanted to achieve a first of his own. If he couldn't be the first of the South Pole, then maybe he could be the first to cross the continent on foot. Shackleton's attempt became one of the most famous expedition disasters in history. Ernest Shackleton was not a scientist like Nansen. He wasn't thinking deeply about the mechanics of the ice and the environment he was venturing into. He was a merchant marine, an adventurer seeking glory and even achieving it as a crew member of several expeditions in Antarctica. In 1907, he earned a spot in the Royal Navy as an officer on Scott's Discovery Expedition. This gave Shackleton the experience to lead expeditions of his own to the southern continent. By the time he attempted a continental crossing, Shackleton had made a serious name for himself as an explorer. Shackleton cobbled together his expedition using donations, and a ship for the mission basically fell into his lap. It was originally called the Polaris. A Belgian explorer commissioned the vessel originally hoping to use it for a polar bear hunting expedition, but financial problems prevented him and his investors from completing the contract. Polaris took some inspiration from Fram and was built using many of the same materials, giving it strength to withstand icy waters. The hull was also somewhat rounded to give resilience against the pressure of crushing ice, but not nearly to the extent of Fram. It was in some sense a tourist ship, not meant to drift on top of the ice for years at a time. So while the Polaris was designed for polar conditions, it was not meant to overwinter. That was fine with Shackleton because overwintering was not part of his plan. The ship was primarily meant to deliver his crew to the continent before their journey over land. So Shackleton purchased the ship and renamed it Endurance. In theory, Endurance would suit the purpose of Shackleton just fine. As they set out for Antarctica in 1914, the drums of war were sounding throughout Europe. World War I was breaking out. Little did Shackleton know he was about to face a battle of his own, one which he was ill-equipped to fight. They arrived in the Weddell Sea in 1914. They noticed pack ice forming earlier than they had anticipated, which did not bode well for conditions closer to land. Shackleton made the decision to proceed anyway. Over the next two months, they struggled against the ice, and the ship took a serious beating. By February, the situation became dire. The ship was trapped in the ice, and the crew of the Endurance was forced to overwinter. Come October 15th, the crew and the ship still survived, and there appeared to be a glimmer of hope. 
cracks in the ice appeared, signaling that the ice might be breaking up. But as the ice moved around the ship, the pressures became too great for endurance. Shackleton watched as day after day the ice battered the ship. On October 17th, pressure from the ice pushed in on the engine room and frightful noises erupted from buckling ice plates. The next day, huge pieces of ice shot up from the sea, tilting the ship. Dog kennels inside Endurance crashed down, creating havoc on board. Like Nassen, Shackleton felt that he was in combat with the ice. The attacks continued each day until finally, on October 27th, Shackleton made the decision to abandon ship. As they left the ship the next day, the endurance was falling to pieces around them. They could feel and hear the death of the ship, and Shackleton described the experience vividly. The twisting, grinding flows were working their will at last on the ship. It was a sickening sensation to feel the decks breaking under one's feet, the great beams bending, and then snapping with a noise like heavy gunfire. Shackleton, page 91. As the ship was consumed by the ice, the crew made camp nearby. The temperatures that night dropped to minus 16 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 27 degrees Celsius. They lived on the ice for six months, dodging cracks that threatened to plunge them into the waters along with their ship. They traveled as far as they could during the days, camping each night and trying their best to preserve rapid, diminishing supplies. The entire time, they dragged boats along and hoped that they could survive to use them. The ice broke up around them in April, and the crew climbed into the lifeboats and took to the water. But if anything, their situation had become even more precarious. They navigated through the treacherous ice in some of the most dangerous waters in the world, all in tiny boats that crashed into bergs or became trapped on ice floes. Against all odds, the crew found land, the tiny elephant island, and set up a more permanent camp. Shackleton put together a plan for rescue. He and four other men piled into one of the small boats the James cared and battled against treacherous seas in search of help. After several attempts, they finally reached South Georgia, where their journey into the Weddell Sea had begun. A rescue was put together, eventually saving the entirety of the crew huddled in wait on Elephant Island. They had never even set foot on the mainland of Antarctica, and their ship rested on the ocean floor, but they survived. Shackleton had taken on extraordinary risk for the sake of the mission in a ship that was not equipped to handle a winter in the ice. Why did he do this? There have been debates about whether Shackleton was a hero or dangerously careless, regardless of which side you fall on. For adventurers like Shackleton, risk was part of the purpose of these expeditions. Without risk, they could not sell their stories, and the explorers could not become heroes. In the end, Endurance's legend Eclipse Frams. This was perhaps not in spite of Endurance's tragic fate and Shackleton's failure, but because of it. Shackleton's expedition had become a story of success from failure, similar to that of Apollo 13. Planning was always an important way for explorers to deal with risk. Shackleton and Nansen's attitude towards planning and risk seemed different on the surface. Shackleton had been warned by whalers familiar with the conditions in the Waddell Sea that his plan was dangerous, but set out on endurance regardless. In contrast, Nansen's expedition followed a plan which, while somewhat controversial, was based on fairly convincing scientific evidence about patterns of Arctic ice drift. He had ample funding and a ship designed with his specific mission in mind. But in the end, Nassen's single-minded quest to seek the pole left him in a survival situation just like Shackleton. For many of the explorers of this era, pursuit of glory overwhelmed other considerations, even their original plans or concerns for their life or the lives of others. Technology was another important part of the risk equation. 
the right equipment could mean life or death for explorers, and selecting the right tools for the job was an important way to manage risk. Fram was one of the few polar exploration ships from that era designed to sail into icy waters and survive overwintering. Its survival is testament to its design. Endurance was also designed for polar conditions, but its failure was not necessarily the fault of its builders. Knowing the capabilities and limitations of your equipment is just as important as having the best equipment. Shackleton's willingness to enter the Weddell Sea put the endurance into conditions beyond its design parameters. The final resting places of the Endurance and the Fram show us the complexities involved in using technology to venture into dangerous territory. Embark on a thrilling journey with We Are Born Explorers. Uncover the secrets of human history, dive into the wonders of science, and traverse the farthest reaches of our planet and beyond. Subscribe and reunite your inner explorer. Your like on this video means a lot to us. Pick your next exploration.